who was the youngest big city health commissioner in a major US city in Detroit, helping rebuild the city's health uh, department after the city's bankruptcy. Micah is also a physician and healthcare researcher, a writer, a policy advisor. He served as a policy a health policy fellow for the House of Representatives, has advised presidential campaigns, has a degree in philosophy, uh, politics and economics from Oxford. He was a Rhodes Scholar got his MD at uh, Harvard and is currently a resident physician in internal medicine in Brigham, at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And gentlemen, one of the things I noticed when, or was obvious when I uh, read your book is that a lot of people want healthcare and they admit that the healthcare system in this country is broken, but fixing it is complicated. You wanna go into that? Absolutely. Well, Tony, thank you so much. And uh, it is a privilege to be with you and uh, really wanna say thank you to the Acapella Books and uh, the, 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 the Carter Library uh, and to you, Tony, for, uh, for hosting this conversation. Really excited to be uh, joining you and um, to talk about something, uh, as you said, that has a lot uh, of focus in uh, in our American discussion, uh, in our politics, certainly in, in public policy. Uh, but that has been extremely vexing, um, to say the least, when it comes to both the history and the present of, of real reform that actually solves all the problems that we face. Um, you know, M Micah and I, uh, we came together around uh, my campaign for governor in Michigan, actually, and I ran on a single payer platform. But one of the things that we both observed in the process of campaigning on a Medicare for all style state uh, reform is that the, the, the conversation had gotten so politicized in the way that a lot of the talking points had been force fed to us uh, by the industry. And we wanted to take this conversation back out of our politics and take it back to that place that we think is the most meaningful, which is uh, our homes, our ourselves, our 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 own uh, in, engagement with our own healthcare and the healthcare of people that we love. Uh, rather than talking about state and federal budgets, we wanted to be talking about kitchen table budgets. Rather than talking uh, about uh, about insured lives uh, or even patient care, we wanted to talk about people and. Uh, we wanted to do this in a way that was engageable, uh, but that spoke through a true and, and, and deep systematic uh, diagnosis of our current healthcare system and why uh, Medicare for all uh, really does map to so many of uh, the challenges. And um, and so, you know, with that, our hope with this citizen's guide is truly to be that, a guide for citizens. Micah? Yeah, thanks again, Tony, for hosting us. And this is really a, a perfect setting to talk about this book, to have a community bookstore and a presidential library. We're really trying to take this issue to where people really think about what matters in their own lives, what matters for their healthcare. And of course, it's a pleasure for me to be to get to talk to an audience in Georgia, which has played such a critical role in, in our politics, really delivered the, uh, the Senate majority that is now this week taking some of the biggest action uh, in terms of government action that we've seen in, in decades. So it, it's a pleasure to be at the center of it. But as Abdul says, we want to step back and take this issue of Medicare for all a little more slowly because too quickly the political talking points are formulated. And by now, most of you who are joining this discussion have probably heard the talking points for and against the 10 second or 15 second version. And we want to step back and think about what this actually means for people in their daily lives? What is it exactly that is going wrong in our current system? And what would it look like for patients, for doctors, for families, for hospitals to actually do this kind of reform? And speaking for myself, I come to this issue of someone who's always believed that healthcare is and ought to be a human right. But when I got to medical school, I saw every day the way that patients are failed by our system. And I trained in Massachusetts, a state where most people have health insurance and their health insurance did not give them access to the care that they needed and did not protect them from financial ruin when they did get sick. So that's, that's the perspective that I come to the book with. And I'm really excited to spend the evening with you all 
And as Abdul and I are, are talking and introducing you to the ideas of the book, please start thinking about the questions that you have for us because we, we hope to spend uh, much of our time tonight talking with you all directly. So Abdul, why don't you kick us off? Absolutely. I want to read um, a little bit from the introduction of the book, uh, because sometimes when we talk about Medicare for all, it feels like, uh, or at least the, the institutions that, uh, that, that B want us to feel like it's this radical idea with, with, with absolutely no precedent uh, in history. And in the process of researching this book, uh, we came to appreciate actually that there's potential, there's, there's plenty of precedent. Um, in fact, it goes as far back uh, as the 18th century, the century in which uh, our country was founded. Let me read uh, to you the first time that our government picked up the mantle uh, of, uh, of of promoting a, a, a more perfect union, excuse me, promoting the general welfare, um, as is called for uh, in the preamble to the Constitution. As early as 1798, the Fifth Congress passed and President John Adams signed an early attempt by the fledgling Republic to promote the general welfare, an act for the relief of sick and disabled seamen. At that time, international trade was vital to the well-being of the United States, although being a sailor was a particularly dangerous trade. To protect its merchant marine, Congress passed the law creating a system of government-run hospitals for seamen funded by a mandatory tax on their earnings. As science advanced through the 19th and 20th century, American, <clears throat> American government acted as a catalyst to convert new knowledge into broad improvements in general welfare, improving sanitation, putting fluoride in drinking water, ensuring widespread vaccination, funding new hospital construction and guaranteeing health insurance for senior citizens. Modern healthcare has developed tools that humanity couldn't have imagined in 1787, from vaccines and antibiotics to robotic surgery, and it targeted immunity therapy. Because of these advances and so many others, nearly 250 years since the people of the United States ordained and established this constitution, American life expectancy has more than doubled. And yet perhaps by the standard of our time and the power and wealth of our country, we are yet failing to promote the general welfare. Life expectancy in the United States is nearly six years shorter than it is in Japan, the longest lived country in the world. American infant mortality ranks 55th in the world. And American health disparities by race and socioeconomic status are among the world's steepest. Perhaps worse, life expectancy has stagnated, even falling for three straight years between 2015 and 2017. Rather than the infectious diseases of the past, the diseases with the predilection for the young today are diseases of despair, drug overdose, alcohol misuse, and death by suicide. By the popular population at large, cancer for the population at large, cancer and heart disease are the top killers. For this mediocrity, Americans pay by far the steepest price for healthcare in the world. We spend 18% of all the money in our economy on healthcare. We are projected to spend over $12,000 per person on healthcare in 2021, double the average in comparable countries, and our costs are increasing rapidly. So I wanted to offer that because um, because again it's easy to think that there is not precedent for this kind of action to promote the general welfare in uh, in American history, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And we know uh, that given the circumstances that we face today, um, that never has this kind of reform been more needed, more pressing uh, than it is right now. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Micah. He can introduce you to somebody who really could use uh, some help with with healthcare. So the topic of American healthcare is enormous. Hundreds of millions of people would be affected. It's a trillion dollar industry. But as a doctor, I really think about things one patient at a time. So let me introduce you to, to one of the remarkable patients that Abdul and I got to know over the course of writing this book. And her story really typifies both the problems and the potential that we're talking about. Lisa Cardillo will never forget her 15th wedding anniversary. After waving goodbye to their three children, Lisa and her husband Dominic drove across the state to Granville, a few miles from Lake Michigan. They had more than their anniversary to celebrate. Dominic, who'd suffered a malignant brain tumor at just 33 years old, was finally three years past his cancer diagnosis. They were eager for a fresh start. But just as they were about to enjoy the day on Lake Michigan's sandy beaches, Lisa felt a sharp burning in the center of her chest. Then came the crippling nausea and abdominal pain. Though Lisa was 36 years old and otherwise healthy, she knew that something was terribly wrong. The Cardillos knew better than to call an ambulance. Dominic's had cost them $800 when he was first diagnosed. They rushed to the car and started Googling nearby hospitals. Dominic stepped on the gas. Lisa's left arm started to go numb. As Lisa walked into the emergency room, she went into cardiac arrest. 
With her heart no longer pumping blood, she crashed to the floor. The emergency room personnel started performing CPR then and there. Over the next nine agonizing days at that hospital, Lisa was diagnosed with a heart attack caused by spontaneous coronary artery dissection, a deadly tearing of one of the arteries that supply blood to the heart. Thankfully, she survived, but that was just the beginning of her ordeal. All of this was extremely expensive. The hospital sent a bill for $185,460. For five months, she had to wear a defibrillator vest, which was another $5,000 a month. Then more bills for cardiac rehab, follow-up appointments, and prescriptions. And here's the thing. The Cardillos have health insurance. Unlike the 30 million Americans who don't have it, they have coverage through Dominic's job as an automotive engineer. Before his diagnosis, they tried to save on premium costs by choosing an insurance plan with a high deductible, meaning they would need to spend more before insurance kicked in. That left them with $12,000 in uncovered medical bills. Their friends eventually started a GoFundMe page and threw an in-person fundraiser to partially allay their debts. Together, their friends and family raised nearly $8,000, just enough to get them back on solid footing. But when January 1st rolled around, their deductible reset and they found themselves back at square one paying for Dominic's ongoing treatment. Beyond the financial toll, there was the personal toll. Lisa spent hours on the phone with the various hospitals, clinics, labs, and imaging centers where they owed money, not to mention pleading with the insurance company to cover the cost of this or that treatment. More than once, she'd found herself crying to the faceless insurance bureaucrat on the other end of the line. She told us, quote, when your medical bills become more stressful than your husband's brain cancer diagnosis, something is not right. Morbidly, Lisa jokes that her favorite bill is the one for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the manual CPR she got in the emergency room. For $568, the hospital personnel saved her life. But because she hadn't met her deductible, she paid for it out of pocket. It's the best $568 I ever spent, she said but should she have had to spend it at all? So I find Lisa's story very powerful, both from a personal standpoint and in terms of the policy and political challenges that we face. Because Lisa and her husband, Dominic, are supposed to be the people who are doing well in our healthcare system. They have so-called good private health insurance through their employer. And nevertheless, when they needed it most, it simply was not there for them. And the problems that the healthcare system faces writ large, we see almost all of them in Lisa's story. First, that it's too expensive. Second, that it leaves too many people out, where Lisa and Dominic are the lucky ones. 30 million Americans don't have any kind of health insurance, and tens of millions more are underinsured. The third problem is that it doesn't keep us healthy. As we know, our life expectancy is the lowest among our peer countries and is now falling. And finally, fourth, the experience of giving and receiving care is eroding, where Lisa, there were times when just navigating the whole complexity was just as bad as the tragic medical facts. So what is Medicare for all? It is a simple idea. The government guarantees comprehensive health insurance to all Americans under a single publicly funded plan. That means everyone would be covered, including Lisa and everyone else in the country, you would no longer have the high deductibles for care that led to these high out-of-pocket costs. You'd crack down on both the administrative overhead and the overcharging for care that leads to high prices in the current system. And it would be far, far simpler to cut down on both the expense and the time in the psychological toll that Lisa and so many others face. But as we know, there's a long way to go between where we are now and getting to Medicare for All. So Abdul, why don't you tell us about what lies ahead for the politics? We're in uh, an, an odd moment. And on the one hand, the push for single payer healthcare, Medicare for all has never been as strong. It is a uh, household issue that people uh, know about and, 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 and can name. And at the same time, um, after two very strong primaries that featured pro Medicare for all candidates, we don't yet have a pro-Medicare for all president. And so this is a unique moment. And the question becomes, if we're serious about this kind of reform, where do we go from here? And we have to build the kind of power that fundamentally changes the conversation about Medicare for all and forces politicians to be accountable. At the same time, we've got two other crises that serve as context for this. 
The first is the crisis of health itself. We are, uh, God willing, coming out of a COVID-19 pandemic under which uh, the uh, <laughs> the entire healthcare system uh, was challenged and much of it uh, crumpled under the weight. Uh, and the second is the crisis of democracy. Um, we know that our, our democracy is uh, getting less and less democratic. The, the proportion uh, and the share of uh, population represented by people in power is, is dwindling as a function of the way the system is built, plus uh, voter suppression and uh, and other tactics. Uh, the power of corporations in our politics uh, continue to erode uh, the, the, the lowercase d democracy inside of our democratic republic. And so um, across these, this is a really challenging moment. And yet it's the, at the same time, it is entirely pregnant uh, with tremendous pop possibility for this. Um, the thing I always remind folks is that uh, a, 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 a pot of water doesn't boil all at once. You have to heat it and heat it. And all you might see is a little bit of steam coming off the top until it starts to roll uh, in a boil. And uh, we're in a moment where there's a lot of steam on the top uh, of the water. And so this is a, a conversation that we're hoping uh, to restart uh, with this book to force uh, and focus our, our, our conversation about what we need to do to solve one of the longest standing problems uh, in American public life. And um, we, uh, we hope that this book is a contribution in that respect. And we're looking forward to, uh, to, to continuing the conversation with you. Uh, if uh, you have questions, I hope that you'll share them and uh, turn it back over to Tony. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, you start out the book by explaining, first of all, a little bit of history uh, that this, the whole issue of whether or not healthcare should be part of the government's responsibility goes back to, I want to say Teddy Roosevelt, wasn't it? That, and, and people all along, uh, Harry Truman uh, uh, pushed it. It was really LA because of his political strength and knowledge of how the system works that was able to get it through. But even then, it didn't, those that, that uh, have Medicare right now, it's a mishmash of really three different programs, isn't it? How did that happen? Yeah, so one thing that I've learned studying the healthcare system is we often see something that doesn't really make sense. We're like, why is it that way? Why on Medicare are there three different insurance plans for hospitals, doctors, and prescription drugs? And we're tempted to think that there's a good rational policy explanation, but so often it's about either an accident of history or a political constraint. And that's exactly what, what happened in Medicare, where in this very clever legislative move, it was Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats had proposed to cover hospital care for everyone. And then as a counter proposal, um, was an idea to have it just be for physician services. And in this brilliant move, the, the member of Congress decided to just staple the two plans together and pass them both at once, and it worked. So that's why we have Medicare Part A and Part B, which just means that your hospital and your doctor visits are um, funded separately. And then as prescription drugs became in more and more common use and there needed to be another benefit to use for prescription drugs, it wasn't until 2003 that this was passed. And because of very successful lobbying by the pharmaceutical industry, two things happened. One, prescription drugs are still covered by private insurance plans, even within Medicare, which makes the whole thing very complicated. And two, Medicare is not allowed to negotiate for the price of those drugs, right? The federal government negotiates for almost everything else that it buys and yet the pharma lobby got in to the Medicare bill. You can't negotiate when it comes to the price of prescription drugs. So I think we take two lessons for this. One is we, when we see something that doesn't make sense in the system and that's hurting people, we shouldn't assume that it's there for a good reason. It, it's often not. So, and the second thing is we need to be clear about what the obstacles are. And, and so often it is the types of weaknesses in our democracy that Abdul is describing at the top of the program, and certainly the power of the healthcare industry that profits from the failures of the system. Then how do you, as one of our, our viewers was asking, how do you 
compete with the megaphone that both the private insurance company has and the drug companies and the hospitals and the doctors, especially following Citizens United, how how is anyone able to compete with that kind of voice? We have a whole uh, chapter in the book called organizing versus advertising, because here's the fact. The industry is exceedingly powerful. Stepping back to just give you, let me give you some numbers. If you look at overall lobbying expenditure by industry over the past 20 years, number one and number two are both healthcare industries. Number one is the pharmaceutical lobby and the second uh, number two is the insurance lobby. And let me just give you some, some context on numbers. 4.4 billion with a B is what the pharmaceutical industry spent. 2.7 billion uh, is what the insurance industry spent. Number eight is the hospitals. So you're talking about some of the richest industries and corporations in the country who are who recognize that there is an imminent need to throw their money around. And that's not even including expenditures uh, to pass disinformation as advertising. And so you take all of those things together and you realize that there is a lot of money uh, toward advertising and it has been extremely lethal, uh, whether it was the pushes under Truman or pushes uh, to, to, to pass state level reform, or it was even the relatively minor reform uh, that the Clintons tried to pass. The industry has been uh, extremely lethal with the way that it's deployed uh, its advertising dollars. The only way uh, to get past that is going to be a groundswell of people building together to pass this reform, to inure themselves, their neighbors, their loved ones, their family members, their coworkers against the kind of disinformation that you're going to see. And my previous book is called Healing Politics, and uh, I diagnosed this epidemic of insecurity. And I, I think you can't undersell the impact of insecurity on shaping the dynamics of the conversation. We in this country have suffered under a governing consensus over the past 40 years that told us that the single best way uh, to provide basic public goods is to sell them off to major corporations to the extraction of uh, most of us in the exclusion of those of us who can't pay. Um, and that has left us expecting that things are just going to get worse every time a politician tells you that they can get better because that's been the experience for most of our lives. If you're younger than 40, that's been your experience your entire life. Um, and, and so we're in this moment right now where uh, that insecurity plays against us. The other point is that the system has gotten so bad that any reform makes it look like you're promising something that's too good to be true because it's so bad. Uh, and uh, and so we, we, we have to recognize that the only way around this is through it. And it's going to take people coming together to decide that we can do this. The good news here is that organizing has never been easier than it is right now. The power of uh, telecommunications and social media and one-to-one uh, -one at scale peer communication is unrivaled. Um, and the second point is that the industry has just gotten too greedy. Um, you know, we talked about Lisa. Lisa wouldn't have been the kind of person that would have been included in the group of people struggling under the status quo even 15, 20 years ago, but she is today. She's somebody who is middle-class, she is insured. And um, because the industry has just gotten so predatory, I think there's a far larger group of people who are uh, susceptible, right? Um, uh, to being hurt by this industry and therefore are primed uh, to be part of the fight. And so um, we hope that that this book will do its part to try and move that conversation, but it's gonna take all of us deciding that we're no longer bystanders in our politics, that instead our politics is a function of what we the people choose to do with it. And uh, should we choose to use it and leverage it against the power of corporations, we can win, um, but it's going to take a lot of effort and they've got all the money, but we've got all the people. And, um, and I think in the long term, that's how change happens in this country. You know, the thing that I remember when uh, the Clinton administration had its own health care proposal and there were ads of a couple sitting around the kitchen table and it was all about, um, oh, they say they're going to change health care, but I, I like the doctor that I'm going to and I, I, you know, I'm, and fear was a big point at of the uh, ads when they choose we lose that was the that was the punchline how do you how do you deal with how do you deal with fear because fear in political ads regardless not just healthcare but throughout the whole political spectrum has become uh fear and and one 
one line, one phrase, one um, socialist or socialized medicine or whatever, uh, those have become the, the catchphrases, uh, the little 10 second phrases that do so well in ads. Yeah, and I think this is a critical question and a few thoughts. One is we know from the polling on Medicare for all that both the positive and negative arguments are effective. And so what we need to be thinking is, we know that people are gonna hear the negative arguments. They've already heard them. We know that these companies have a big war chest to fund more of these messages as, as this debate progresses. So the question is, what can we do to make sure that folks are also hearing the positive messages? And so much of that comes back to all of what Abdul just beautifully described. And part of it's this organizing plus the messaging when you know, they, they can hire someone to pretend to be your neighbors sitting at a kitchen table. But what's even more effective if your actual neighbors sitting at your actual kitchen table are talking to you about, about this idea. The, and the, the second piece here is going back to what makes it possible um, for, to, to scare people about their healthcare. And one of the effective tactics, I think, is to, to lean in, to remind people how unstable the status quo is. Because one of the things that the health insurance companies like to do is they accuse Medicare for all of doing what they themselves are currently doing. The biggest reason that restricts what doctor you can see is your insurance company. And one of the most effective tools of Medicare for all advocates is to explain that Medicare for all increases your choice. It lets you keep your current doctor. And in fact, it expands your choices. If you want to see a different specialist, you can go to any hospital you want. You have more access to the prescription drugs that you need. So I think it's difficult, but I think if you can get past one layer, just this veneer of fear about change, and you can tell people that under Medicare for all, you're gonna keep your health insurance no matter what happens to you. And you can keep seeing your current doctor and your treatments are gonna cost less. I think together with the organizing that Abdul is talking about, you start to see what the outlines of a successful campaign might be. And I just wanna build on that real quick. <clears throat> you know, the interesting thing is we just came out of uh, four years of, of Trump and Trumpism. Um, which one of the principal tactics of, uh, of, of, of the Trump era uh, was, was the gaslighting that accused you of doing the thing that they were doing themselves. So Trump would say, uh, you know, they are, they're, they're, they are uh, trying to steal this election. And obviously Trump and his team were trying to steal the election. Um, and th the power of that, right, is that it is extremely disorienting. And I'll be honest, right? The health insurance industry has been doing exactly the same thing for a very long time. They're going to take away your choice. Well, here's the thing, right? The principal barrier to choice in our healthcare system is the health insurance industry who tells you what doctor you can see and what you, who you can't see. They're going to tell you they're going to ration your care, right? Well, who is rationing care? Health insurance. They're just doing it through this extremely opaque bureaucratic system that basically denies you the health care you already paid for or forces you to pay through another paywall to get the care you already paid for in the form of a premium. Or they'll tell you it's going to cost too much. Meanwhile, we spend 18% of every dollar spent in the entire economy on health care, right? And, uh, and all of that goes to pay for an overhead that is bloated. Meanwhile, 10% of people don't get access to healthcare at all. So th this is the circumstance that we're in. It is a principal tool of disinformation. And I hate to say it, but like, just because it's legal and you can buy it and you can put it on a 30 second ad on TV doesn't make it true. And, and unfortunately, this is exactly what they've done. And so the only way to counteract uh, that, right, is to inure people to it uh, through a system of grassroots organizing. And has to start from the very bottom. Uh, and build upward. But, um, you know, they have the money, they have the power and they will do everything they possibly can to persist. I just want to remind folks, uh, you know, while we were suffering just about a year ago under the early days of this pandemic, millions of people were losing their jobs. You know who had the best quarter uh, of, of, of that they'd ever had? The health insurance industry. Why? Because all of these uh, elective procedures that got canceled, that was just money in their pockets. That was money that the health insurance industry didn't have to pay out. They made nearly double their profits. And guess what? I love the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package that just passed, except for one part of it. The fact that we basically 
us as taxpayers had to pay the insurance industry to keep the people who lost their insurance while the insurance companies were making nearly twofold as much as they, as they had made, right, to put them back on their insurance. And so, you know, this system is one that does not behave, does not act in the best interest of all of us because we've, we've turned it into a system of profit on two ends, whether it's the payers for healthcare or the providers for healthcare. One thing, you're not only to try and sell this, you're not only competing with um, whether it's fear tactics or their description of it, but you know we're taught in schools from kindergarten on about the free market, that this is a country where the free market um, works and that the free market is the thing that should hold costs down and make things available uh, to, to people, that that's, that's one of the foundations of this country. I'll, no? I'll say two things. I'll say two things about that. I think one is, you know, we can be scientists about this. We, we can look at the data. And when we, we can compare private health insurance versus public health insurance through, through Medicare. And we have this ethos that, oh, of course, the private market is going to keep costs down. But in healthcare, it's, it's simply not true. So in terms of the prices paid for healthcare, Medicare gets a 30 to 50% discount on private insurance. And you know, one of my favorite studies in healthcare is what happens when people who have private insurance, the day they turn 65 and go on to Medicare, what happens to healthcare costs? Overnight, they go down 30% because Medicare has an ability to negotiate healthcare prices that's just unmatched by any private insurance company. So, so that's the data. We just know it's not true um, that the private market controls costs better. But when we open up the box and ask why, we shouldn't be surprised. You know, think about Lisa. The, the way that the, the free market advocates want us to think about healthcare is, okay, you, when you're sick, you know what the, the prices are, you compare across different providers, you think about what it's worth to you, you decide whether or not to pay for it. I mean, when Lisa got a heart pump implanted, you know, she was unconscious. And the, the, the fact of the matter is our costs aren't high from, you know, healthy people deciding to get an extra MRI when they hurt their knee. Most of our healthcare spending goes towards people who are very ill. And in those situations, it, it just isn't the case that people are thinking and acting like consumers. So I think that's actually one of the most powerful messages that I hope comes out of our book, because to most people, I think it's natural. We understand the, the ethical benefits of having a universal public program. I think most people understand that giving everyone health care would be a really good thing from a moral point of view. What I think less people understand is the terrible economic cost that we bring on by pretending like we can treat healthcare like a free market and then exhibiting all the failures that, that Lisa and so many others face day in and day out. Let me, let me just also add on a, a little bit to that. I thought that was, uh, that is, that is a brilliant explanation, Micah. Um, you know, we're taught to think of ourselves always as consumers, uh, but in this scenario, the consumer model doesn't really work. And let me just explain why. Imagine y'all are in Atlanta. Imagine I, I, we went down to the, uh, the cab farmer's market, okay? And, um, and we decided we wanna buy some kohlrabi at the market. Uh, you pick out your kohlrabi, you take the kohlrabi to the cashier, you tell the cashier that you'd like to buy this kohlrabi, they weigh it out for you. They say, look, it's two bucks a pound. You got a half a pound, so you, do, you, you charged a dollar, right? You pay a dollar to the cashier, that kohlrabi is now yours, you go home. That's how customer behavior works. You know exactly what you want. You know how much of it you want. There's a clear choice about how much it's gonna cost you. And the choice of the transaction, whether or not that kohlrabi is worth a dollar is made clear to you. And then you purchase your kohlrabi, money changes hands and you, you go home. In our system, right? I want you to really, really interrogate that analogy for a second, right? Because here's how it works. You are down here. There's a provider of healthcare here, and there is a payer for healthcare, an insurance company here. Usually what happens is if you have the privilege of being insured, right, you and your employer, they're gonna, you're all both gonna pay some amount of money for the privilege of having insurance, okay? You pay it every two weeks, you pay it every month, it comes out of your uh, paycheck. And then you get sick, 
Hopefully this doesn't happen to you, but then you get sick, right? Then you go to the provider here and you get your care. Then, right, you're never told what the price was. In fact, you didn't really have a choice in the care because you didn't really care about whether or not, right, you, the price was you needed the care because, of course, healthcare is something that you need and usually you need it emergently. Nobody ever plans to need healthcare, right? Ideally, you wouldn't need it. That's part of the problem. And so your demand is what they call inelastic. So what happens now is that this provider then bills your insurance, right, for the care that you just got. I want you to think about something. If being a customer meant that you had a choice in the matter, right, and you paid the money to the, the provider of that good, right, then are you the customer in the circumstance? You're not, right? You are the reason a financial transaction happened between the payer and the provider of healthcare. You're not actually the customer in our system. You are the product. You're a reason a financial transaction happened. Uh, and that there is part of the problem. The second part of the problem, Tony, is that we don't actually want health care, right? If I had a choice, I could say, listen, Tony, I'm going to sell you five MRIs for 500 bucks, which is the steal, by the way, right? And the average MRI is costing you several thousands. And, I, and if you don't need an MRI, you're not going to buy it because most of us don't have 500 bucks sitting around and we're not going to buy five MRIs. The minute you go out and maybe play with your kid or your grandkid, you're playing some football, you feel a pop in your knee and all of a sudden you're like, oh God, right? I think something's wrong with my knee. And at that point, I come back to you and I say, no, Tony, I'm sorry. I had five for 500. Now I'm gonna give you one for 5,000. And most of the time, if you can afford it, you're gonna buy it. Why? Because you want your knee to work. And so what you want here is not actually healthcare. I was gonna sell you healthcare in the first circumstance. What you want is health. And only after you get sick is healthcare a means to getting health. And that's part of the problem. And so in this system, there is really no incentive to keep you from hurting yourself. There's an incentive to sell you the thing that you now demand inelastically after you need it. And, um, and to, to take advantage of the fact that you're in a state of need when you need it. And the fact that the person who is selling you the good is usually also the person who's telling you what good you need, which is a kind of a problem. So yes, I love markets when it comes to, I don't know, buying this fancy Michigan football helmet or buying a book or buying a car or buying, the, buying a piece of clothing. I don't love it so much when uh, it's buying healthcare, which is something I buy under duress, right? And is fundamental to my ability to live uh, in this circumstance. Yeah, and there are there are different prices depending on, uh, you can, I, I know of a case where uh, someone went in to get um, a, a hearing aid and there was one price if they paid for it but there was another price about twice as much or three times as much if they had insurance and the insurance was going to pay for it. Yeah. And, you know, it, it gets even more wild in a way that healthcare isn't like other markets. You know, uh, the price of a book is the price of a book and everyone knows what it is and the market can work based on that. In healthcare, you can be, say, you and your cousin go in to the same hospital to get the same procedure, maybe you're even neighbors in the hospital room getting treated by the same doctor, the price of that procedure could vary by a factor of two, three, or 10, depending on what kind of insurance you have. And, but it's, I think it's even more, more nefarious than that too, though, because the, the way that we pay for care and what economists will say is that what a price is, it's a signal of value. The problem with that is we, through our price system in healthcare, value the lives of poor people less than rich people. That is just the truth. If you're a primary care doctor, you get paid half as much to see a poor person on Medicaid than a wealthier person on private insurance. So that is a moral problem at the core of our healthcare system. And it's worth pointing out that most incremental reforms to the system, they don't change that. You put more people on the Affordable Care Act, doesn't change this idea that we are valuing people's bodies and lives differently with the price tag that we're putting on their care. So that's one of the, the things that we say is that, yes, there are multiple ways to, to get everyone some kind of health insurance, but there really are not a lot of ways in doing that in an equitable way. And one of the attractions of Medicare for all is it is equitable. A doctor in a hospital would get paid the same 
whether a rich person, a poor person, a white person, a person of color walks into the room. And that's a, a powerful way to reorganize the way that healthcare works, to say as a society that we are going to put an equal value on anyone's body who walks in. But one of the things that you all point out, and you know, they often say the devil's in the details, are the trade-offs that happen. And you use some different surveys about if someone has to, if the, the recipient, if the individual that is covered by Medicare uh, for all, um, uh, any of the cost, they then, is there a tendency for them to want to get everything? Uh, or are they thinking, I think your example was, are they thinking down the road that maybe I don't want a colonoscopy because they may find something and then I might have to pay for something else down the road. It's, it is not a simple, the details are not simple. There are a lot of very difficult choices. That's right, Tony. Um, you know, the hard part is that uh, basically since the 70s, the insurance industry has used the results of a very famous uh, health insurance experiment uh, called the RAND study. It's sort of what they call it. It's done by the RAND Corporation about health usage and cost upfront. And they found that when people have to pay some money upfront, they use less health care. The problem with that, though, is that part of what you get when you when you buy healthcare isn't just the treatment it's also the diagnosis and so as you're thinking about the healthcare that you need if there's a barrier up front to getting healthcare you may not actually get care that you actually need as a function of the cost so people are not good at discriminating whether or not it's care that they need or care that they don't economists assume this away they say well uh, people are rational, right? which, um, you know, when, when the foundation of your entire uh, model is kind of off, uh, it, it, it tends to skew the results. But they say, well, you know, consumers are rational. They know exactly what they need and how much of it they need. And uh, they're constantly weighing that against the cost. The problem is, is that by definition, because you go to your healthcare provider for the diagnosis itself, you don't actually know what you need. You don't know whether or not that pain in your gut is the beginning of a very terrible colon cancer, or is it some pain in your gut because you got gas, right? You don't know the difference between that. And so if uh, if you're, you're, you need to get healthcare in the first place to figure that out, well, it's going to interrupt your ability to make smart decisions. And so we've put this barrier in front of people in ways uh, that tend to discriminate against uh, getting healthcare generally as if that's some sort of good, rather than uh, in a way that allows them to actually get the highest value care. The other point I'll make about that is that, you know, we would rather not get sick at all in the first place than get sick and get healthcare, right? That's the, the, the point that I was making about that MRI example. And um, our system doesn't do a great job of preventing uh, poor health in the first place, as this COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated in some glaring detail. And part of that is because it's so expensive as it is that it sort of crowds out anything else that we might do uh, to improve uh, health outcomes over the long term. And usually that has nothing to do with what happens inside a clinic or a hospital. That has a lot more to do with how it happens outside those clinics and hospitals, particularly when you're talking about the deep disparities in our society when it comes to health. So um, as a former health commissioner, to be honest, I got to health care because I have been asking myself, what do we do to actually promote health? And health care has become such a, uh, uh, such a giant elephant in the room that not until we actually take on health care uh, will we get to the issue of actually promoting health? And so uh, the hope is, is that in, in, in this kind of uh, reform, uh, you are actually addressing the health care issue. And also because Medicare becomes your insurer yesterday, today and tomorrow, they have the incentive to keep you healthy in the first place. 900 different insurers in our current system, you're right. By the time they actually invest in your, 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 your prevention, you're going to have moved on to a different insurer. And in the last case, right, you make it to 65 and now you're insured by Medicare. So if Medicare is your insurer yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it carries the incentive to invest in those social determinants of health that we talk about uh, and to keep you healthy in the first place. One of the things that you all discuss in terms of uh, payment 
payment for services. You also discuss um, the or, or fee for services. You also discuss a, a global payment model, much like, in fact, you use the example of uh, fire departments. Uh, you don't uh, charge someone uh, for uh, if their house catches on fire, uh, that sort of thing. You just you pay for that services. What's the benefit and the, the drawback of such a system? So I would say the big picture here is that we in health policy spend a lot of time thinking about this very wonky question of how should the pool of money, the payer, pay the individual doctor or hospital? And the big picture to take away is that under Medicare for All, where there's one payment stream, you have far more of an ability to innovate with how you pay. Because with 900 different insurance companies, if one insurance company changes the way that they pay, it really doesn't change things that much. So that's, that's the big picture, is that under Medicare for All, you can actually do a lot to change how we pay in the system. This specific piece of paying hospitals a budget for their care, rather than every time a patient comes in, is you flip the incentives on their head. Where right now, a hospital really, to maximize their profits and their margins, they want to stay full. They wanna have as many people coming in through their doors as possible, and because they're paid one at a time, they have these enormous billing departments just to deal with the day in and day out burden of the system. So, you know, famously, the Duke University hospital system has 1,000 hospital beds and 1,500 billing clerks. That is the kind of absurdity that you end up with when you have such a, a complicated, complicated payment system. So one idea is you give, give the hospital a budget and have them focus not on how to bring in the money and how to bill for it, but how to actually spend it on the community to, to keep folks healthy. One other issue that you talk about both in, in the section about healthcare being unavailable and one of the challenges of, of Medicare for, uh, for all is rural healthcare. Um, the lack uh, and, and in fact, because Hospitals keep um, uh, joining together, uh, takeovers. Uh, you have a large hospitals, and then you have massive underserved areas. How would having Medicare for all help serve those that are underserved or are not served at all? Yeah, um, Micah spoke to the moral absurdity of reimbursing care for different people's bodies differently based on how they, how much money they make. We know that the distribution of poverty uh, is not equal. It's more likely to be in rural communities and more likely to be in urban communities. And there's a knock on impact of that reimbursement, which is that the institutions that uh, predominantly serve poor people tend not to be reimbursed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the work that they need to do in the same way and those hospitals tend to either be forced out of business or sold to large for-profit corporations to deliver very shoddy healthcare to the level where they can at least try and profiteer off of, off of, off of serving those patients. And you see both of those things happening in both urban and rural communities. In rural communities, those hospitals usually shut down because of the lack of density. And so we've seen 120 hospitals shut down in the last 10 years, 12 shut down in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. In urban communities, you end up seeing these corporatized, formerly nonprofit, even public hospitals. In the city where I used to be health commissioner in Detroit, uh, the Detroit Medical Center was sold to a for-profit corporation, and in 2016 got in trouble because they couldn't even autoclave their instruments. And so you're, you're seeing this consequence uh, reverberate through the system, and it's not just hospitals. It's also uh, pri primary care providers. In the city of Detroit, you literally can outline the entire city. If you were just make a little map of primary care providers, they don't locate in the city. They locate right outside the city. And, um, and, and that's because they don't tend to want to take Medicaid patients because they tend to be more work and tend to be less reimbursement. And, um, and so we have to appreciate the systems level consequences of our choices and uh, our moral failure to invest in different people's bodies the same ways. One other issue that you all bring up, um, and I'm sure in this 
debate would come up is about the price of prescription drugs. And the argument that we hear so often is prescription drugs have to be um, priced high to pay for the research and development and that the drug companies need to be able to recoup that expense through patents and, and the like um, over a period of, of years. So is that an obstacle that can or cannot be overcome? So there's so many things to be said on this issue and I wish we had a whole nother hour to talk about prescription drugs because we're, we're just so off base in the way that we're treating this issue in this country. And you know, I should preface this by saying that having new and better prescription drugs is fantastic. And I, it's, it's a privilege to be able to be in my primary care clinic and to be prescribing these new therapies that decrease heart attacks, make people live longer. It's amazing. The problem is the people who need these medicines most aren't getting them. And we've normalized that part of medical training that I have to work every day to overcome is the normalization of this idea that your patient the best treatment for them, they can't afford. And we see that so often that it's hard not to have that become normal. In terms of the, the innovation question, I'll, I'll just say, say one thing and I'll let Abdul weigh in as well because it's a, a longer conversation. But look, scientists and researchers don't need these huge monopoly profits at the end of the day for them to be motivated to do their work, right? We see in... COVID, the, the public spirit that so many scientists that are doing the work um, have. So what we're really talking about is we're talking about funding. We're talking about money. How, what's the best way to get money to scientists and researchers to, to discover products? And it just turns out that having huge high profits at the end of the day is a really inefficient way of doing that. You know, pharmaceutical companies are spending a small fraction of their revenue on R&D. So what I advocate for is that if what we want is giving more money to researchers so they can do their work, we should do that. We should directly through the government give more money to researchers to, to do their work. And you know, one of my one of my colleagues who I think may may be watching this evening ha has beautiful research that shows that public investment in research and development for drugs, those drugs are more innovative. Those are the breakthrough drugs, the ones that are, are risky and funded by the NIH and other institutions. That's how we really get breakthroughs. So I think we should be doing much more of that. Let's have government fund truly innovative cures that are then made available to the public as generics. And let's really get serious about cracking down on the price gouging that we see in, in the pharmaceutical industry today. Did, did we learn anything about that uh, in this last year with the vaccine research of the vaccines? Yeah, let me let me let me offer um, a couple of things that we learned. Uh, so you know, yes, we have some incredible uh, vaccines that are safe and effective and out there, and that's great. Most of them were funded by the federal government, right? Major boluses of funding. Uh, that the government guaranteed upfront funding and guaranteed purchase uh, at the at the outset, right? So if that's not government subsidizing uh, these corporations, who, by the way, are getting all the credit, um, I don't know what is. At the same time, we have these vaccines, and because we did very little investment in our basic public health infrastructure, it's like we designed a McLaren X1 engine and then dropped it into the body of a Ford Pinto. And so the big issue here has been deployment. And um, and so, yes, you get these vaccines and then you can't get them out to people because you haven't invested in the basic blocking and tackling uh, of public health. And then the third piece is that, you know, even when it came to uh, the, the medications to treat COVID-19, um, some of the early ones, remdesivir being an important one, the corporation that designed, that, that, that manufactured remdesivir uh, happened to be sitting on this drug. They did zero R&D for it. They just tried an old drug that was designed against Ebola for this new cause. And in the process, when they tried to apply for an authorization, they applied they applied for uh, what was an orphan drug category so they could protect their patent 
Um, and, uh, and, and this in the context of a pandemic, this is not the kind of uh, disease for which they weren't going to find patients. 500,000 people died of this disease, right? Millions more got the disease, but they were doing it to play games with their patent. And they'd done the same exact thing when they uh, bought a, um, a, a, a cure for hepatitis C, which has basically kept us because they, they set the cost so high. Um, uh, it has kept us from being able to cure hepatitis C. I mean, in theory, we could leverage this drug to cure hepatitis C, but the same games that they played around drug cost uh, and around protecting patents have kept us from doing that. And so um, we have to be honest about the games that they play. And yes, you know, are they doing their part in the pandemic? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm always going to say, like, I'm, I'm grateful to Pfizer and BioNTech and, and Johnson and & Johnson and Moderna uh, for creating vaccines that we can use. At the same time, I really wish that they weren't doing it uh, entirely around a profit mo motive. And I really wish that the games that they played didn't keep people from getting the drugs that they needed all the time. And I really wish that they would be honest and upfront about the fact that they spend a lot more money uh, uh, advertising and marketing their medications than they do in research and developing them. And I really wish that they would be honest about the fact that most of the R&D that's done isn't actually done in-house. They sold off those labs a long time ago, and instead uh, they buy up what look to be promising drugs that usually roll out of NIH-funded, federally federal government-funded laboratories at universities uh, that turn into biotech uh, uh, companies and then get, get bought up. And so we've just got to be honest about how this system works and the consequences of it. And I'd just like to make one big picture point here, because part of what Medicare for All asks us to do is to reimagine the way that we approach healthcare. And the hepatitis C drugs that Abdul described are a perfect example, where there are so we, we could cure this disease, this disease that leads to cirrhosis and cancer and death, we could cure it with the medication that we have. But because we treat it like a consumer product, very few people are, are getting it and the prices are super high and it's rationed. What if we were to treat that like a public good? What if we were to take a public health approach to health insurance and medicines? What if we were treating this like we're treating the COVID vaccine rollout? When you have an amazing new drug, what if you put in a public health program at no cost to the individual trying to, to get the treatments out? So I think it's just one example of what we're really talking about with this policy is a different way of thinking about healthcare. And then once you put public health rather than profit motive, at the heart, I think we're only beginning to understand how much would be possible. Well, you know, one of the, the first questions that, that came up was how do you, um, how, do, how does the public uh, compete with the giant megaphone of the industry, the healthcare industry? And I would suggest that your all's book, reading your your book, is one of those one of those ways. Because and you and you really need to have it where you can sit down and and read it. This is not just light reading. You have to understand it. Uh, Acapella Books has uh, copies of Medicare for All, um, and I think they have uh, signed book plates as well for those, and I would encourage people to uh, to get those. Uh, it is a fascinating discussion, and as Micah said, we could go on for an hour, a couple of hours, just uh, trying to to cover all the uh, the topics. Abdul Asayed and Michael Johnson, thank you very much uh, uh, for really a, a fascinating book and a, a wonderful explanation of, uh, of this. Uh, this is a debate that we will see coming for, uh, for some time. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate uh, your uh, being with us tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tony. Thanks so much. And thank for you again, us. Dr. Pella and uh, the, the Carter Library. Thanks.